technology. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible this morning, ooh, it is hot. If you got your Bible this morning, mine is my phone. Hold it up for me. We're going to say a little decoration together. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I will boldly confess that my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. It's a it's a wonderful pleasure to be here this morning with you and hadn't had a chance to share with you lately, so I've got an extra amount. Amen. I'm just kidding. I won't give you all of that I that I've got. I heard a funny story about a about a pastor that was uh, speaking at a cowboy church and so he had prepared his message and and that particular morning, only one person showed up to hear the message. And so the pastor went on and uh, talked to the one guy that showed up and said, Listen, you're the only one here today. Do you, would you still like me to preach? He said, Yes, sir. He said, You know, I own a, uh, a farm. And he said, If only one cow shows up, I still take the opportunity to feed that one cow. He said, So I'm the only congregation member here. If you would, take the opportunity to share your message. So... Sure enough, about an hour and a half went by. The preacher went on with his message. He got done. He looked at the one guy that showed up, said, how did I do? He said, you did good. He said, but let me tell you something. He said, you know, the, the food that I had for all of my cows, if only one cow showed up, I wouldn't give all the food to the one cow. Y'all catch that when you're going home. Amen. Uh, well, uh, this morning I want to... First of all, uh, we got plenty of youngins. Is the youngins standing here or going out this morning? Leaving the youngins in here. Well, bless you, youngins, for putting up with me this morning. I'll, I'll try to be entertaining for you. <clears throat> it is a blessing to have our visitors, our family, our guests. I, I see Blake's family and my dear, beloved Uncle Harold and his family and so many more. Thank you for being here, Steve. And, uh, I think we're going to have some baptismal this morning. Good job. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my message this morning is going to be kind of what we're talking about already, some purpose for the pain that we've been going through. Amen. And whether or not it was a coincidence or for a purpose. So many times we, we tell stories in our lives and it'll be blessings involved or some kind of a close call involved and we'll say, man, that was just by luck that that happened or that was just coincidence that that happened. But how many knows that the God that we serve has got some purpose in mind? Amen. Amen. And I want to talk to you about some, some people in the Bible like myself who have made mistakes, have made uh, mishaps, and, and yet God turned their mistake into a miracle. Really a mistake into a mission, if you want to call it that, uh, is what I want to share a little bit about this morning. Number one fellow that I want to share about is a guy named David. Many of you have heard about David and, and Goliath and, and David and killing the lions. Well, let me tell you a little bit about David. David had seen God accomplish many things in his life, things from from, like I just mentioned, uh, the defeat of a lion and a bear with his bare hands. There was a bear and a lion that came attacking his flock, and David was gifted with the ability to take out the bear and the lion through the hip of God. Amen. He had also seen God use him to defeat the giant, Goliath. Amen. He had seen God take him from, from being a, forgotten, a forgotten son and on the backside of the the cattle field to becoming the king of Israel. Amen. He had seen God do some pretty awesome things in his life. Yet what, like so many of us uh, included, he made a mistake. He was out one day. He was taking a nap in his kingdom palace. And, and as he goes out onto his balcony, he observes a beautiful lady out taking a bath. And he began to have lust for the lady. You see, and the problem was is that this lady that he was looking at happened to be married. And David happened to be the king of her husband who was a soldier for David in the war and was out actually fighting a battle for, for King David. Yet King David decided to bring this lady into his house 
and have relations. And, and what you will find out is that that decision to, to yield to that temptation of lust eventually led to, to adultery. It led to an unwanted pregnancy and actually a plan to cover a murder with a plan to cover up his mistake. How many knows it'd be awesome if we could cover up every mistake that we make, but we can't? The scripture says that the truth will find you out kind of thing, and it does always find you out. Amen. But, but the Bible tells us that even though, even though David wound up with his, with his initial desire, the, the desire for the, for the beautiful lady, uh, his heart was not satisfied, especially after he made this adultery uh, decision. His life was not satisfied for, for more than a, a full year. It was a few years that went by that David was just absolutely miserable in his decision. If we're not careful, sometimes we can mistake this as just another coincidental story. Or maybe, maybe we would describe it as David just made a mistake and, and he's got to deal with the fate of his, his decision. And, and uh, you know, the poor guy, we feel sorry for him. But, but what you have to remember is that God that we serve can, make, uh, can turn purpose of a mistake into a mission. You see, my, my best advice that I could have gave David maybe would have been to simply move on with his life. But instead of David hearing my advice, I think that he tapped into God that he knew from an early childhood. You see, David had already experienced the goodness of God. He had already been blessed with, with many miracles, if you will, up at this point. So he knew the character of God. He knew that the God that we served was a forgiven God, a loving God, a merciful God. And so he knew that all he had to do was reach up and ask God to help him to forgive him, and he would, and that's what David did. Matter of fact, later in the Bible, it describes David as being a man after God's own heart. And you say, how could, how could God say that that's my favorite? That's the way I, dis I understand God saying that David was a man after my own heart, was to think that David must have been one of God's favorites. Now, how would God have a favorite that is a sinner? Let me tell you, let me inform you that, first of all, for all have sinned, and came short of the glory of God. So if you've got sin in your life, don't worry about God singling you out or giving up on you. He can take your mistake and turn it into a miraculous, not just a mission, but a miraculous mission. Amen. And David found purpose in allowing his consequences to push him back toward God. Amen. A reminder that anything given to God can have purpose. The, net, the second guy I want to talk to you today about is a guy that we also are probably all familiar with, Mr. Jonah, Jonah and the whale we, we, uh, that got swallowed by the big fish. When we look at Jonah in the beginning of Jonah, it's a very clear command that God gave Jonah. He told him his, Jonah was a prophet, and he told Jonah, hey, you being a preacher, you being a prophet, I need you to go down to this city called Nineveh. You see, Nineveh was a, was a big city. It was a large city. Scripture says it took almost three days to see the entire city of Nineveh. So it must have been huge. And God told to Jonah to go down to the city of Nineveh and preach the gospel. But Jonah decided to go somewhere else. Amen. He, he decided to, to go down to uh, Tarshish. Let me see where my scripture is here. Uh, Jonah decided he went down to, to uh a place called Tarshish, and that's, uh, bought him a ticket, I'm sorry, at the port of Joppa, bought him a ticket leaving for Tarshish, which, if you know anything about the map of the Bible, Tarshish was the complete opposite way of Nineveh. How many of you have ever found yourself going the opposite way of where God told you to go? I know I have, and, and I've went as fast as I could go, hoping God would forget about asking me to do whatever He was asking me to do, amen. But God wanted to use Jonah to see Nineveh be turned from their sinful ways and begin to worship the God that he served. But like we are all guilty at times, Jonah's plan was a little different from what God's plan was. Instead of going in the right direction, he went into the opposite direction. God could have given up on Jonah and chose someone else maybe to accomplish his mission. So many times me and Blake was having a conversation about whether or not it was a good idea for me to be God or not. And I said, I don't think it would be a good idea for me to be God. Because as soon as somebody messed up, I'd be like, bam, you're out of here, buddy. Oh, you did that again. Bam, you're gone. Oh, don't even think about it. I'll go ahead and cut you off. I mean, I'd snuff them out pretty much, myself included, if I was God. I'd have just put an end to it. Thank God I'm not God. Amen. 
Amen. God is a loving, He is a merciful, He is a graceful God, and the things that you think is going to take you in one direction, God's got planned to, to use it in a whole other direction. Amen. But, but Jonah goes from his boat of disobedience to the belly of a fish. What happened was he got cast off of a ship. And it says that God actually designed, and is one way that I understand it, He planned for this fish. It, we often call it a well, but really the Scripture just said it was a large fish. But it says that God had prepared this fish a long time ahead of this event. You see, I believe God's got preparations for you a long time before you ever mess up. He's already got the answer for you prior to you having the problem, if you will. Amen. And God, uh, Jonah, it says here that he goes from the boat of disobedience to the belly of a fish. How many knows if, if you sin bad enough that God has you swallowed up by a fish, it's probably a pretty bad sin because I hadn't been swallowed up yet. I don't know about you. But Jonah must have really made God upset. But as we look at Jonah and what he does while he's in this well, we get a glimpse of a prayer that Jonah prayed. Number one, I don't believe that, that Jonah prayed for deliverance. It didn't say so. It didn't say, Lord, let me get out of this fish. It didn't say anything of the nature. Matter of fact, it says that Jonah simply began to repent. He began to ask God to, to forgive him for his mistake. He began to praise God for all that he had already done. And the next thing you know, it, it talks about the fish spits Jonah out. Amen. This was a prayer of Jonah, not asking for deliverance, but just, uh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong thing there. I already said that. Jonah's prayer is seeking God's forgiveness, and he's seeking God's repentance. <clears throat> a failure that is sinful enough for God to, to have you swallowed up by a fish is is for sure failure, amen. But apparently, we're not God, so we, we, did, we don't get to de determine whether or not that failure is, is uh, unreturnable because God says, once again, get up for a second time and go to Nineveh. You see, God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and on and on and on, and I believe this is an example of that second chance. But God brought Jonah problem for a purpose and let me share what I'm what I want to say about that first of all Jonah suffered he and he suffered the consequences but he sought repentance from the hand of God and because Jonah had experienced repentance he was now willing to preach that very same thing to the people of Nineveh uh, you'll hear me often say I offer much forgiveness because I require much forgiveness See, I believe if you'll re realize what it is that you require and you start planting some seeds for that, you'll, you'll be able to expect to harvest when that time comes. Amen. But I offer a lot of forgiveness because I require a lot of forgiveness, meaning that I make a lot of mistakes. I need y'all to forgive me a lot of times. Amen. But in exchange, I'm willing to forgive y'all. If you ever make a mistake against me, amen, I believe it's a, don't, I always talk about this one thing that is agreeable amongst all religions in the world, whether it be Hindu or, or Buddhism or whatever the religion is, all religions agree on one thing, and that is seed equals harvest. You think about it. Some of them call it karma. Some of them call it what goes around comes around. Some of it calls, hey, you'll reap what you sow, but they're wrong. Me and Blake talked about this. If, if you only reaped what you sow, you would sow a pecan and get a pecan. That's not the way it works. When you, when you sow a pecan, you get a tree that produces pecans. And sometimes those pecans produce another tree that produces more pecans. Be careful what seeds it is that you're sowing. Because they always come later, they always come greater, but they usually always come. And there's, there's seeds for the briar patch, just like there are seeds for the apple tree. Be careful what you're sowing. But that's the one thing that all religions agree on is, is seed equals harvest. I believe you should plant some seeds. Amen. Amen. But when God forgives us, where much is, where much is given, much is required, Scripture says. God forgave uh, Jonah, and in return, Jonah wanted to preach the message of forgiveness. So many times for me, there's people in my life that, that I, I secretly hope that they don't go to, to heaven with me, not really. Hope that they don't go to the same place with me because I don't want to put up with them. I'm not sure if Jonah didn't also feel that way about Nineveh. He didn't want them boys to be in heaven with him. I don't know what his reasoning was. Scripture doesn't really explain 
But for whatever reason, Jonah didn't want to go. Or maybe he just thought he was too good for him. Maybe he thought that he had not made those type mistakes and, and he didn't have a, a message for him. Well, let me tell you, God allowed him to make a mistake so that he could have a message. My message this morning is turning your mistake into a miracle or turning your, your mi- mistake into a message is what I think happened because Jonah began to, to preach the, the revival there and the entire city was turned back to God. And when I imagine what Jonah must have said to them, he, he may have said something like, hey, guys, you better repent. God's going to destroy your city in 40 days. And, and just look at me. I disobeyed God, and I got swallowed by a fish. I encourage you to not let that happen to you. I can just hear Jonah's sermon being spoken to these Ninevites is that, hey, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. You see, I believe we go through the things that we go through because it adds a tool in our toolbox that can be used to change other lives. I believe my mother going through the stroke was a tool in her toolbox to to give her boldness, to give her courage that she may witness and change lives with her story of what God has done for her. This week, uh, Blake, uh, I don't know if you mind me telling you this story. I'll just tell you a story about somebody else. My own life, I wound up playing around with sin. And one thing that I learned, my father always taught me, I always knew this saying, but was that sin will take you further than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. You see, I was one of those little kids that, that thought he was a superhero and that I could do things that others were getting in trouble with and I could get away with it. And so what I did was begin to play with drugs, and ultimately I wound up playing with crack cocaine and I got addicted badly to crack cocaine. It was unbelievably, I, I told Blake this week, I was the, one of the worst of the worst. I was on it bad. And, and, but prior to, getting to, to making a decision to play with drugs, I was against everybody that played with drugs. I thought they were dirty. I thought they were trashy. I thought they were just stupid for making those decisions. And and how would you do something that you hear everybody in the entire world telling you it's going to kill you? Why would you even play with that? And then all of a sudden, I found myself doing it. I found myself doing the very thing I said I wouldn't do. Well, let me tell you what happened when God finally delivered me from it. It made me have a super sensitive, a super passionate, a super mission to help others that were going through what it is that I had went through. And this week we'll be sending number four of of clients to a uh, rehabilitation center in Carrollton. Number fourth person will be going this week. And let me tell you, that's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. I've had help with one of the clients that I sent through. But let me just tell you, the price tag is about $9,000 a year. We're on number four. That, if you do the math, that's $36,000 that this delivered crackhead has helped to pay for. Then let me tell you, when you're smoking crack, you don't have $36,000. And if you're not smoking crack, you may not have the heart to invest $36,000 into somebody's life that is. But because I went through what I went through, God developed a passion. He turned my mistake into a mission to help others. Amen. Amen. He has changed my life to where now I really believe I've got a magnet on my back for those that are going through problems that they come to me. They find their way to me, and and we join together, team up with God Almighty, and we change the way we're doing business. The other thing about that is that I now have a lot of forgiveness for those boys that have done exactly what I did because I needed a lot of forgiveness. Amen. And here Jonah sinned, he suffered the consequences, he sought repentance from the hand of God, and he went on to Nineveh and preached a powerful message, and the entire city was changed, it says. It says one thing kind of made me laugh was that the king came off of the throne, pulled off his robe, put on a sackcloth, basically rags, and called for a fast. Nobody could eat or drink, and everybody had to pray, including the animals, Even the dog didn't get any water and and food those few days. Amen. This deal, this king was serious about repentance. I believe we've got to get serious about repentance. Amen. The third person I want to talk to you about this morning is a guy named Peter. 
Now, many of you know Peter was actually a disciple of Jesus. He ran around neck to neck with Jesus. He was the guy that, that was a fisherman, and, and Jesus said, Hey, come with me, and I'll make you fishermen of men. Jesus was a friend of, uh, Peter was a friend of Jesus. He, he experienced very awesome moments in the presence of Jesus. Amen. He, he was right there with him, and then one day, in a, in a moment of need, and Jesus is one of his greatest moments of need. When, when Jesus was about to be crucified on the cross, here Peter was out in the courtyard sitting down with the soldiers around the campfire, and guess who asked him if he was a follower of Jesus? It wasn't a soldier. It wasn't a big guy with a sword. It wasn't a, uh, some mighty warrior. It was a little girl that said, hey, wasn't you part of the Jesus crew? And Peter said, no, 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 I, I don't know anything about that. No, that wasn't me. But see, Jesus had told Peter, he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. Peter said, not me, Jesus, I'm your friend. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm here to the end. No way will I ever deny you, Christ. Jesus said, I'm telling you, you will. And so here, here Peter is around the campfire, and the, and the little girl says, was you a part of the crew? And he says, no, first time. A little while later, somebody else comes up and says, Hey, wasn't you a part of Jesus' team? No, 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 you're, you're full of it. And so all of a sudden, a third person comes by and says the same thing. Wasn't, wasn't you that guy I saw walking with Jesus? And Peter says with some cuss words, No, that was not me. He actually started cussing a little bit the way I understand it. And let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I, I have denied Jesus, but I, I've never verbally denied Jesus. Thank God. Matter of fact, in my mind, when I think about this situation, I don't know exactly the definition of blasphemy till its fullest, but it's almost as the way I understand it is that you know God and then you denied God. It was, Peter was flirting with blasphemy if I ever heard somebody flirting with blasphemy. But yet, Christ forgave Peter. Amen. It says that when Jesus was rose for, risen from the dead, that, that he immediately went after Peter and found Peter and meets Peter personally and offers him some renewal, offers him some restoration, offers him some purpose for his mistake. Because not, Peter was not the only one that has denied Christ. Maybe not verbally, but we have denied Christ in, in obeying his instruction. We have denied Christ in the way we act, the way we walk, the way we talk. Sometimes we go the opposite way on purpose so you won't know that we're a Christian. Amen. We, and, and we try to, uh, we, we're scared to invite folks to church sometimes because they know what we did on Saturday night. Amen. We have to be careful the, way, the many ways that we deny Christ. That is a form of denying Christ when you don't reach out and try to help save some person because of your own choices that you've made to, that were against what God wanted for you. Amen. We got to be careful. But, but here Jesus goes to Peter and personally offers him forgiveness. Peter knew, uh, Jesus knew what Peter was going to do before he ever did it. He must have been prepared to forgive Peter the moment that he said, I need forgiveness, Lord. I believe that way. I believe that God knows our, our, our past, our present, and our future. And I believe that he's got a, a fish prepared for you, for lack of words, to take care of you whenever you make a mistake, to, to gobble you up and to help you. Amen. A lesson. Uh, let's see here. Where would I go there? Uh, oh, after he meets Jesus as a wiser man, Peter, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to build his, house, his church upon Peter, called him the rock. He, he renamed Peter the rock. So Jesus had high hopes of Peter. Matter of fact, a little bit older and later in Peter's life, when Peter was a little bit older, Peter writes in, in Peter 3, 5, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of your hope that is in you. You see, I believe that the things that God has brought you through, I believe that it is designed for a purpose. It's taking your mistake and putting it into a mission that, that you should be ready 
to talk about God delivering you from crack cocaine like I shared with you this morning, to be ready for, to talk about God delivering you and forgiving you for the day that you denied Him, to be ready to, for God to, to share with, you, with others that God forgave you even for adultery even for lust, even for having that affair, whatever sin that you've done, you need to be able to share that Jesus is still willing to forgive you for it because He is. There is no sin that I'm aware of other than blasphemy that is unforgivable. I've said it this way. I believe you've got to fight and scream to get to hell because God has made such a way, such, a, such an opportunity for you to go to heaven that if you actually go to hell, you is really fighting and screaming against God. You is just saying, Lord, no, I really want to go to hell. It, it's got to be a lot of work, amen, because Jesus made it easy. Your want to is the only requirement. You never get it right. Scripture said that, that we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God, that, that nobody was perfect except Jesus. So if that be the case, we've all got some hope in here. Amen? We've all got some hope in here. And I don't know about you, but I've never had an adulterous affair that I wound up killing the dude that was the husband of the woman I was messing around with and then tried to lie and cover it up. I've never done that. So, so far, I'm ahead of David. I've never denied... Jesus three times in that short of a distance. So I hope, I am pray that I'm ahead of, of Peter. And, and then uh, <clears throat> we're about to talk about another guy here. And this guy, let's see here. I'm sorry, I, I talked about David. I talked about Jonah. That's who I, I've never uh, got swallowed by a fish. So I hope I'm, a, I'm ahead of Jonah. And then we're going to talk about one more guy if those three wasn't good enough. And this guy was a guy by the name of Saul. Now, Saul later had his name changed to Paul, but, Paul, but Saul, prior to being changed, his name being changed to Paul, was a notorious dude who actually killed Christians. He loved to kill them. He, he was uh, uh, mad at all the Christians. He was mad at Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the Lord and, and Savior. He didn't believe that he was the, the Son of God. And, uh, and so here we, we, look at, uh, we look at Peter, and, and you ask yourself sometimes, uh, how bad can a guy be that, and God still be able to save you? Well, let me, this guy was pretty bad, amen. For me, when I think about who is too bad to, be, to go to heaven, maybe I think about the guy at Alcatraz prison and top security. You know, I watched that Alcatraz doc documentary last night, so... I get to use that one today, but those boys was pretty tough. They were so rough around the edges, they put them on an island so that if they broke out of the cell and then they broke out of the fence and they'd still have to swim ever how far across the San Francisco Bay and that was notorious for a tidal event that would wash you out and never return and, and uh, those people maybe would be some that I would say, yeah, they're definitely going to hell. You know, maybe there's some folks in your life that you say, yeah, they're definitely going to hell. We was, we was talking about Japanese beetles the other night, and I was talking about when I was a kid, I'd thump the heads off of them, and I told Blake that was one of those things that would definitely send you to hell. Thank God he forgave me for thumping the heads off of Japanese beetles. But I've done some stuff that deserved to be going to hell. If I was God, I'd send me to hell. Matter of fact, I don't think I'd wait till hell. I think I'd just zap you right now. I wouldn't wait till the, till the judgment day. But here Paul's one of those guys. Paul is a bad dude. If I was God and I said, there's one I'm not forgiven, it'd been Paul. But you see, <clears throat> Paul, though, he, was, he was a bad one, but he wasn't too bad for God. In the, in the books of, of Acts, if we'd had a survey and asked that question, Saul would have definitely qualified to be on the list of those that wouldn't go to heaven. But uh, we look here, uh, I want to read to you what Scripture says about Paul. In, in the Acts chapter 9, it says that, that Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Every breath that he breathed, he was talking about killing Christians. This guy was obsessed with going against what the plan of God was for the, in that particular time and even to this day. He was an enemy of the church. He was in opposition to the cause of Christ. Matter of fact, uh, we see that Jesus uh, himself asked Paul, said, why are you pers persecuting me? Jesus viewed him as his own personal persecutor, his own personal antagonizer. J Jesus saw him as his own personal enemy. 
Amen. Yet on that day, the very thing that, that, that Peter uh, would deny later, he actually preached. Instead of denying Christ, now he preached about the, the real Christ and, and the realness of Christ. And, he, and God turned his mistake into a mission. He turned his mistake into a purpose. He changed his pain to some purpose. Amen. Amen. And it was, a, it was a transformation that was amazing to the point that I believe probably other Christians said, I don't believe Jesus really changed that guy. He's faking it. He's putting on a show. He was way too bad to be really a Christian. No way can that guy change his ways. It, it's just impossible. There's a lot of folks that I know that if, if God changed their ways, I may question that God could actually change them, except that I know he changed old Caleb Gooden. And I was pretty rough around the edges. Hey, Amen. I was, I was ranked at number 10 on a 1 through 10 scale on, on the worst boys that I was hanging around with. I was no good. I, I didn't think in my own heart that God could change what I, the direction that I was going. Matter of fact, I was sure I was scheduled for death. I even looked for trees to hit because I thought that was the only way I could quit doing the crack cocaine. I, I thought I had to die to quit. I didn't think I could ever get away from that. But let me tell you, this past January, I celebrated 24 years clean of crack cocaine. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand. I didn't think I could make it 24 minutes, much less 24 years. And here God has changed my life to the point and gave me money to be able to help others. Let me tell you something about that. Me and Blake were talking about this week is that y'all have heard me talk about it many a times is that God won't give you what you're not ready for. And I gave the example that if I went around my, my, I, my son Isaac's having a birthday September the 1st coming up. And if I sit here and I told you today that, that I gave, I've got a new F-450 Dually pickup truck ready for my son's birthday coming up. You guys would all applaud, and you would say, Hey, man, you're a great dad. Look at you. You're buying great presents for your son. Man, that's awesome. I wished I could do that. I mean, the conversation would be pretty awesome about me buying my son a new truck. You'd think I was a good guy. Until I told you that he was turning four years old on September the 1st. Then you would say, Are you an idiot? What kind of daddy? Or do you love your son at all? Do you, you're going to get him killed. You're going to put him in your 450, crank it up, put it in gear, let him go driving out on the town. You're really trying to get rid of that little boy, ain't you? You'd change your opinion if you knew that Isaac was not ready for that F-450 truck. You'd change your opinion because... You see, I believe God is the same way. I believe until you are ready for the blessings that He has in store for you, it could literally be a death sentence. You think about me, at the level of success that I'm at right now, if I decided to go smoke crack cocaine again today, it would kill me. Because my bank account is such that I would die way before I depleted my finances. Whereas before when I was using crack, that was the only way I quit for the night was that I depleted all of my finances. I depleted all opportunity for, for resources that may have additional finances. I, I used all means necessary to fulfill my addictive nature. If I, had, if I chose that today, it would kill me because... But, but the, the good news is, is that God has matured me. I'm not four years old anymore. Amen. I'm, I'm 24 years clean and sober, and God has, has proven me through test after test after test that I can handle the next step. I've passed this course. Now I can move to the next test. Until you pass the course of, of saying and showing, not just saying, your actions is what really God is looking at. Until you show signs that you are ready for the blessings of God, you might not get them. You might not get them to the level that I've got them at. Not to say I'm ahead of you, but for some I may be. I don't know your, your status. But I can tell you that if you'll prepare yourself first, then God can do a great thing with you. But it's all about process. It's all about what are you going to do with it. You see, I, I don't believe God should bless you at all if you're not planning on being a blessing to others. There's no reason for you to be really blessed he, he give you just enough for you, but if you really want to get out of the box, God will give you enough not just for you, but others. 
That's how come I'm, I'm blessed to where I can now invest in others to go through programs in the amount of $36,000. God gave me a want to to bless others. God gave me a desire, a mission, if you will, to invest in others. And I know that if I don't use it, I could, I could lose it. My prayer is that I may be an instrument, a vessel that God can work through, can use to help others. I believe that's our entire mission as Christian is to help others and to understand that, that those around us need encouraging. Those around us need help. Those around us need to hear about the goodness of God. I'm so excited this morning about Blake getting baptized and Steve getting baptized because I know that is an, an, outward, uh, 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 an outward sign of an, uh, uh, of an inward commitment. And, and their families, I encourage their families to come this morning because... Families, you get to be the ones that not only help hold him accountable, but get to, to partake in the, in the benefit of what God's about to do in their lives. Who knows, Blake, Steve, I don't know your financial status, but God may be getting ready to make them boys such a financial blessing that all of your family gets to get your bills paid by them as part of the being around them. Let me tell you, if you'll hang around blessed folks, you'll get a blessing, amen? You'll get a blessing. Uh, those that you hang around should rub off on you a little bit. But in that drastic transformation, Paul began, to, he, he, uh, Saul changed, God changed Saul's name to Paul, and not only was he a, uh, he went from being a Christian killer, a murderer, a hater of everything to do with Jesus, to being a guy who loved Jesus so much that he wrote over half of the Bible. He became known as the Apostle Paul. He was, he was one of the greatest heroes of the Bible, but yet he originally was a murderer. I don't know about you, but, but I personally have never got swallowed by a fish. I never committed murder and, to, to cover up my adulterous affair. Uh, I never uh, denied Christ. I never even killed a Christian before. But Jesus had a plan for me to be more than I am and more than I was. And I believe he's got a plan for you to be more than you are and more than, than you were. And, and where you are today is not where God wants you to be tomorrow. You may be doing pretty good today, but God wants you to be doing even better tomorrow. Amen. My father didn't share the message, the testimony about my Aunt Yvonne's uh, son, Wyatt, and, and the awesome testimony that he is. But, but what you got to know is that Yvonne was first facing cancer. It looked like God was going to, she was going to leave this earth prematurely. It was a big deal. It was a major cancer issue. But as she began to receive treatment, the way I understand it, correct me if I'm telling this wrong, ain't it, Vaughn? As she began to, to receive treatment for the cancer, she originally was told she couldn't have any babies. She, was, she wasn't able to. Well, I guess her and Uncle Harold must have wanted some. They got some. Whether they wanted one or not, they got one. But God must have seen Aunt Yvonne's heart because he gave her a miracle in the middle of her pain. She was facing cancer. She began to get treatment for cancer. It changed her body, put it in perfect position to bear a child. How many knows when Yvonne first heard she had cancer, it probably wasn't very good news at all. She was probably planning her exit. If, if it was me, I would have been planning my exit. Let's go ahead and write the will. Let's go ahead and tell who we're going to give the, the goodies to and plan our way out of here. I wouldn't have had hope that I was going to be pregnant and having a baby. I can tell you that. Amen. But uh, Aina Vaughn now has a, well, I started to say beautiful boy. I have to be careful. I don't know if he's beautiful. Pretty handsome fella. Now that uh, he is 12 years old and, and Aina Vaughn, guess what, is cancer free. Amen. Amen. Give, give God a hand. That's a big one to give a hand for. Amen. So the problems, the failures, the mistakes, even the things that you did nothing to do to bring on yourself, God can use for His mission, for His message to be shared, for, for salvation to so many around you. God can use what it is you're going through. So don't discount that pain. Don't discount that Burden. Don't discount that problem that you're facing. It may actually be part of the plan of God to take you to a new level 
to let you share what God has done for you. You see, when, when you go to other countries, well, my father tells this story, I'll use it. When he goes to other countries, especially Africa, he'll ask them, hey, what should I speak on? And almost 100% of the time, they'll say, tell what God has done for you. You see, but, and I believe that is, is, this is the reason for that is that, that as I begin to witness to you, if you've never read the Bible, you've never been to Sunday school, and I told you that Peter walked on the water, or that Jonah got swallowed by a whale, or that David killed a giant with a slingshot, you'd think I was lying. You'd, you'd think, man, what kind of a wacky weed's that guy been smoking? Ain't nobody ever walked on water. Ain't nobody ever lived by being swallowed by a fish. You, 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 this guy, is, he's a mess. He's got some sure enough stories. But if I tell you about my own story of, of Jesus healing me from crack cocaine addiction or my own story of where I wanted to die to, where, to the point I was looking at trees trying to pick out which one I'd hit while I was going down the road. I wanted to die. I didn't think I could quit any other way. If I told you about that Jesus delivered me and he blessed me with a pocketbook now that I can bless others and, and that he has blessed me to get up on this pulpit and share with you that the, the love of Christ and the grace of Christ and the mercy of Christ exists for no matter how bad you are, even the, the most murderous of Christians, that, that if I share that with you and tell you that God did it for me and he can do it for you, then you can believe that story. You see, you may take away every scripture I ever learned, and you won't change the faith walk that I have b between me and Christ because I know that God did it personally for me. And if you ripped up my Bible and I never got to read it again, I've got enough in here of my own Bible stories that I know God is real. God is a powerful God, and He can deliver you and save you and heal you from any situation that you may come up with and tell me the story about. It's not too bad for God. Amen. Amen. We're going to end right there. Start playing the music, if you will. It gives me great honor this morning to share with you of how good the God is that we serve. He is loving. He is forgiving. There is nothing you've done too bad for Him to change your, your life, to change your circumstances. And not only that, but to use what it is that you've been through as a mission, as a message, as a way to bring others to Christ. Amen. Let it be useful. Let that pain have a purpose. Amen. Amen. Start playing the music. <clears throat> I want to tell you, David made a choice to give in to temptation. Jonah made a choice to disobey God. Peter made a choice to deny Christ. I made a, a choice also to deny Christ. But, let me tell you, David decided to seek God's forgiveness. Jonah sought God's forgiveness. Peter repented and sought God's forgiveness. I repented and sought God's forgiveness. All you got to do is ask. It's free for the asking. If you ask God, Lord, just forgive me. I can't do it alone. I've been messing up for so long. I don't even know if I can quit tomorrow, Father, but my want to is here. That's the only qualification is the want to. It's the want to. You see, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, you just got to believe that it's possible. You just got to believe it and you got to want it and know that it's possible, that they would have everlasting life. Today you can have eternal life in the presence of God. In heaven's almighty, wonderful vacation resort, if you decide you want it, all you got to do is ask for it. Your sin is not too great. Your, your sin is not too great. The only sin that's not going to be forgiven is the one you didn't ask forgiveness for. We have not because we ask not. Today, I'd like for everybody to close, their, close your eyes, bow your heads, and let's, let's just take a moment, examine our lives. If you've not experienced Christ as your Savior, maybe you've thought that you've, you've lived a life so bad that, that I can't change now. People will laugh at me. People will call me fake. People will, will treat me like they treated Paul and say that, that transition, that, that, the, that deliverance is not true. He's faking it. There's no way that can be true. Maybe you're here and, and you feel like Paul. Been living this life for so long I can't change now. Let me tell you something. It, that's not true. That's not true. God can change you no matter where you are. 
And no matter how long you've been there, and no matter how much it has cost you to be there, God can restore it. He can deliver you from that. He can turn your mistake into a mission if you simply want it. If you're here today and you say, Caleb, I want it. I don't qualify, but I sure do want to have that, that eternal heaven, that eternal peace, that joy, that, that deliverance right here on earth. Lord, I, Caleb, I want it. All you got to do is raise your hand. Raise your hand with me. I'm raising my hands because I want it. If you're here today, I, I suggest you raise your hand and want it too. God's got a purpose for your pain. He's got a purpose for your mistakes. He's got a new situation for the situation that you're in. Nothing is too big for God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. You can put them down now. Let's pray this prayer together. I'll make it easy on you. We've got a baptismal we're about to do, but, but it's a simple prayer. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Today I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's as easy as that. Three sentences, and God changes you. It's an awesome experience. Even this old crackhead here you're before you, God took me and changed me, and I personally didn't believe in myself. I personally didn't believe in myself. God believes in you. Amen. God believes in you. Papa, you got anything you want to say? It's been a wonderful message this morning. I believe God orchestrated it for this time, for this, this divine moment. Don't leave here the same in Jesus' name. And I want to tell you something else. If you're not careful, you see, I heard a story about this demon that was trying out to be on the, on the devil crew. And, and the first one said, uh, the devil asked the first demon, said, Hey, uh, how do you intend to, uh, to trick and to deceive the people? And he said, Well, uh, you know, I'll just tell them they got... They're going to get some gold and gifts when they sell dope. They're going to have a pocket full of money when they're doing this or that. And, and, the, and the devil said, that's pretty good. And he looked at the second demon applying for the job. He said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really, you know, run them off the road and, and take their life to a, to a trench. And we're going to trick them in this way and that way. And he said, that's pretty good. But, but he looked at the third one and said, what is your way you're going to trick people? He said, I'm going to tell them they got more time. I'm going to tell them they can wait till tomorrow. They don't have to make that decision today. They can make it tomorrow. And the devil said, you're hired. Because that's the biggest trick, the best trick I can use on anybody is to tell you that you don't have to do it today. You can do it tomorrow. But let me tell you, tomorrow's not promised. Matter of fact, this afternoon is not promised. Maybe you're here, you didn't raise your hand and because you were embarrassed or you were shameful. Let me tell you, when you get out of here or you go to the bathroom, don't wait. Ask God to come into your life. Ask God to make a difference. Ask God to turn your pain into purpose. Ask it not to be wasted moments, to be wasted mistakes. Don't wait. That's the biggest trick the devil can use. Amen. Come on, Papa. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand from Pastor Caleb Gooden. Amen. Wonderful message. Oh, Lord, he gave you about five uh, levels of people denying Christ and running from Christ and not accepting Christ and included himself into that. How I many, when you when you heard him include himself, you included yourself into that story? All of us, have, the Bible said, all of us have sinned and came short of the glory of God. There's no perfect people on this planet. And I've met a few that thought they was perfect. Have you ever th met some that thought you was perfect? But you hang around them for a while and you finally figure out they're not perfect at all. It reminds me of a, a street lady who went to a church. She said she'd never been to church in her whole life. Never been to church. And she went to this huge church where they had pyramids of, 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 of uh, balconies. And they put her up there, and they sit, and the balcony looped around the church like this on both sides, and they put her on the far left side, so which means that when she looked, she looked across to the right side, and she seen people over here on the right side. She said she started looking, and she said these people over here was waving. She'd never been in church, so she waved back. You know, a lot of people don't know how to act in church. They don't know what church is all about, but it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. And as Caleb said this morning, you make, you make a decision.
today for Christ. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I accept you. Just that simple. That moment, and that moment is the moment that you have came into the family of God, and your destiny is heaven. Amen. So that's a pretty good deal. Amen. This morning, we've got um, Blake and um, what's the other brother's name? Stephen is going to be baptized this morning, and we've got Daniel Mangus is going to help us do this. If you all want to take a picture or something, family, want to take a picture, want to come up here, or just want to come up here and see these guys, come on up here. All right. Daniel is our new member of the church, him and Kaylee. And we, he, wants, he, said, he told me last night, he said, I want to be used in ministry. And I thought, we'll use you. Cold water's first. <laughs> all right. Let them all come up here. This is a beautiful family. I hope you make plans to come back next week and be with us. And Tuesday night is an awesome night. Sister Ruth is teaching on Tuesday night. And Tuesday night is actually better than Sunday morning. So uh, if, you, if you live in the area, come on be with us. Are you guys ready to take your snappies? They call, and, and, okay, oh, Caleb's going to get here with you. Okay. Oh, okay. You ain't getting there by yourself, huh? Hallelujah. But we are happy that you came today, and we're happy that everybody here, my brother and his wife and family came, and uh, here come Caleb running through. It goes on the back there, make sure everything's working out. This is the team ministry here, brother. Everybody to each a ministry. Yes. Pray for the fish. Pray for the fish. <laughs> Are you guys ready? Praise God. I was talking with the guys here a minute ago about their testimony and how God found them and how they found him. Bishop and I had a chance to... God found me, thank you, Lord, many years ago. But uh, when we went to Nigeria early this year, at the hotel we were staying in, there was a bar, and I was outside watching. And Nigeria's got these two-foot bats, okay? I'm an outside guy, so I love outdoor nature stuff. So at 1130 at night, after sitting out, go from tree to tree. Well, as I was going in to go to my room, I had to cut through the hotel bar. When I got in there, there was this guy sitting there, and I mean, he was sauced. And he says, hey, preacher, come talk to me. Well, I'm never going to pass up an opportunity to have a conversation with the devil. Hello? So I went over, I sat down, I started talking with this man. About 20 minutes, now this is 1130 at night, about 20 minutes go by about midnight, another man walks in and he sits down with us and starts talking into the conversation. About another 30 minutes, now 1230 at night, this other guy, guy number one, gets up and leaves. So this other guy, he and I are sitting there talking, and he's asking que conversation questions about God, about church, about things about the relationship with the Lord. And about that time, another couple from Nigeria, minister couple, come in. They sat down and joined the conversation. So now we're at 1 a.m. in the morning, still answering Bible questions for this man. And about 125, 130, he says, well, excuse me, I have to get up and go use the bathroom. So he slipped out at 130 in the morning. When, as he went out, I told the couple that was there, minister couple, when he comes back in, he's going to give his life to Jesus. And he come in, he sat back down in his chair, and this is what I said to him. I said, you know, you've told me a lot of things that you know God, you know everything about him, but you don't know him in here. And at 1.45 in the morning, that man prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart and into his life. See, God will find you wherever you're at. And no matter your age, he'll find you if you'll say, hey, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm reminded in the book of Acts chapter 16, there was Peter and the, the fellows were in jail. And there was a jailer taking care of them. Well, at midnight, because they were singing and praising God, there was an earthquake. The jailer thought they'd all escape. But he, they, they called out to him and said, no, no, we're still here. We're doing good. And what he did was he ended up taking them all home with him and caring for them. And that jailer and his family were baptized. They gave their heart to Jesus and were baptized. So we thank God that these guys are here this morning and God is working in their hearts and their lives. So without further ado. Hallelujah. Well, this guy here I'm very proud of. 
I believe God put him in my life. My wife, I think, may love him more than I love him. I don't know. We, our whole family loves Mr. Blake. And uh, just a, full of joy, full of a smile, full of a energy. One of the hardest workers I've, I believe I've met. And, uh, and so my wife and I have, have took him under our wing and, and gives us great pleasure today, Mr. Blake. I believe that God has, has a purpose for you. You've got a beautiful family. I believe that, that maybe uh, God may just use you to touch many, many family yes. members and friends and those around you, even those on the job side. I believe God's got a, a, a plan for you, a big plan, not just a little plan. Amen. And, uh, and so I'm very proud of this guy, and Steve, too. I don't have as big of a story on Steve, but we will one day. Amen. He, but uh, anyway, uh, I've asked uh, Brother Daniel to help me because these boys is bigger than I am, and I'm afraid they'll take me under the water with them if we're not careful. But anyway, all right. Well, here we go, Papa. baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Give God a hand for that. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, this young man walked in here with a whole yard full of people. I know he's going to be used of God. Amen. It's already. Hallelujah. Give God a hand for Stephen. Give God a hand for Stephen. Here he comes. Stephen's coming down. Take a man to make a decision. Take a wimp to walk. Amen. Well, Mr. Steve, I, I know you're a Tallapoosa local, so that makes you qualified already. No, I'm just kidding. We love Tallapoosa folks and love our community. Steve and Katrina, that's your Katrina came when I was not here, so uh, when I finally showed up, I had heard all about them and, and the excitement from the other family that... Uh, That, oh, this is, well, Lord of mercy, that's really one I can talk about because my wife and I have been making uh, the church, not just my wife and I, we as a family have been making investments in our playground, and uh, and you don't think about a playground leading folks to, to having a life-changed commitment to Christ, but that's what we're seeing and making us want to invest that much more into our community event center. That, this church is called Re Rehoboth Christian Center. I believe it's not just a church. It's a center for our families to, to come and hang out and to have fun and to dwell in a safe place, in a, in a place with provision. And so I, I believe we're seeing that come to pass. Amen. And Stephen, Katrina, and Blake, and these that are, that are giving their life to Christ, I believe this is part of that plan developing, Papa. You may live long enough to see that all your dreams come true. Amen. Uh, Stephen, tell us how many y'all had out there last time. I said 75. It might not be that many. 50. <laughs> Bust my bubble. Amen. You really helped me right there. But 75 folk out there. You know what I'm about. So I'm just stretching stuff. But it was. And, and, and the beauty of it was all mixed, color, mixed people. It's not just one side of it. This our church is for everybody, not just one side. Baptize him in the name of the Father. Hallelujah. Give God a hand for Stephen. Amen. Amen and amen. Don't you fall down in that pool, Miss Gooden. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. You want to say anything? You're good. He said he's good. Well, praise God. Are you family good? 